we'll go ahead and, and get started. We, I've, we've been thinking about doing a, a little e-seminar because we've done them before, but particularly in light of uh, a lot of the, the, the pretty radical changes that are happening in domestic fisheries right now because of uh, coronavirus. And um, some of them are pretty unique to um, the fisheries sector. Some of them are not so unique to the fisheries sector. And, um, you know, we're just going to spend the next 25 or 30 minutes um, talking about not only how, um, what's going on in U.S. fisheries, but how that happened. Um, and if you're on this slide, uh, I've gone to the next slide, um, you know, really U.S. fisheries, most domestic wild fisheries have been reeling in the United States for the last three months. Um, this is uh, some of the photographs in this slide are uh, actually from uh, the Finlander 2, uh, which is a scallop and, um, and hook and line uh, ground fish boat out of New England. If anybody is a member on our call and you uh, purchase scallops, um, there's a good chance that your scallops came from the Finlander. Um, and the Finlander, as well as thousands of other American fishermen, tens of thousands of other American fishermen, um, have, have been um, in a pretty significant, experienced pretty significant change to their fisheries in the last, uh, as I said, uh, three months. And uh, those, the crisis that they've experienced, uh, have been experiencing, has been really um, kind of unheard of. Uh, in most of their lifetimes. Um, there's really three situations um, that I would say every U.S. fisherman finds themselves in right now. Um, and, and they're the three that I've laid out in this slide. Uh, the first one is uh, there's been a, a, a wide number of fisheries, uh, dozens um, of fisheries that have been um, canceled due to lack of markets. Um, meaning that fisheries managers have made the decision that it's not even worth fishermen to leave the dock um, because uh, the market for uh, their fish has not developed. The two that come immediately to mind are two from southeast Alaska, um, one it, it being the gooey duck fishery, which is a large clam fishery, and the other being a herring fishery. Uh, the second condition that most uh, fishermen find themselves in um, are there, they are choosing to be tied up at the dock uh, because right now the cost of fishing far out uh, exceeds the price uh, they're being paid uh, for that fish. Um, or the third condition is the fishermen that are fishing, um, nearly every species and price that I've been able to see, it seems like uh, Fishermen are fishing for about 30 to 50 percent less than they were in 2019. Um, so they're not tying them to, they're themselves up to the dock, um, but they are um, very likely fishing, fishing just barely able to uh, cover their fixed costs. And you know, as I said, I don't know of a single U.S. fishery right now um, that isn't in one of these three situations: either a fishery being canceled. Um, a fishery being um, uh, caught, uh, the, the fish that they're catching um, being about 30 to 50 percent less than at the dock, or um, the fishermen just tying themselves up to the dock because they aren't making what they had thought um, they were going to make. You know, the question is why, right? Why is this happening, and why has this been happening for uh, the last three months? in the United States? Um, well, the, the simplest answer to that is, you know, America's fishermen all fish for an export economy in one way or another. Um, in some way, shape, or form, um, every American fisherman is tied to an export economy. Even those who fish for domestic uh, markets, um, you, it's impossible to separate the domestic from the export market. And really this has been the case for all U.S. coastal communities throughout times. You know, the Pacific Rim is tied to the Pacific Rim. The Atlantic is tied to the Atlantic. And um, as export economies have been crumbling 
um, in the last three months, um, we've seen these radical changes reverberate to our fleet. Um, here's, a, here's five stats for you to really be able to wrap your head around um, just how much U.S. Uh, fisheries are tied to export. About one-third of uh, the total U.S. wild fish harvest goes to China, um, either for processing and or consumption. And uh, U.S. fisheries have really felt that um, strongly first, um, mostly because of the importance of eating fish and crustaceans in the Lunar New Year, the Chinese New Year, um, which takes place um, this, well, changes every year, but it took place this year in January. Um, that Chinese New Year is tremendously important for the U.S. crustacean market. Um, and that did not happen this year. And really, that was some of the most significant early shocks. Um, that represented the most significant early shock um, to U.S. fisheries was um, the widespread um, cancellation or diminishment of Chinese New Year. Um, about one quarter of all U.S. wild fish goes to the EU. About two-thirds of total wild salmon harvest in the United States goes to China, even for, either for consumption or for processing. Uh, about half of U.S. lobster goes to China. Um, US, U.S. lobster fishermen right now are reeling, um, perhaps worse than any other um, individual sector because of their relationship to the export market to China. Um, and, um, you know, it's not entirely clear, but, you know, somewhere around a billion dollars of, of Alaska's $1.6 billion harvest is exported with uh, either to China or Japan being uh, where most of uh, those go. So, you know, what we've seen here is just a total um, collapse of uh, the the global marketplace for these for these fishermen. And you know, in reality, you know, America's fish are are one of the most highly tr traded commodities on earth. And China is America's premier seafood trading partner. So, both as an importer of fish and an exporter of fish. Uh, that the, the U.S. and Chinese trade relationship is a, a key driver of everything that our fishermen do and everything that our uh, fisheries um, uh, do. And you can't separate what China does from what U.S. fisheries do. Um, beyond that, you know, uh, America's wild harvest that stays in the country um, about 60% of that goes to restaurants. So as we began to see this crisis unfold in January and uh, February, um, we really felt the collapse of the Chinese market and then the EU market. Uh, but now in the last two or three weeks, as we've all been in stay at home, uh, stay safer at home as we are here in Wisconsin or shelter in place orders, um, you know, the, the rest of the fisheries market um, has fallen. Um, and really what we're, what we're looking at is only a tiny, tiny fraction of U.S. domestic wild production goes to domestic consumption. And uh, that's, what, that's where we are right now. We've had a total upending of our domestic fish market. Um, with price collapse, collapses, fishermen tied up to the dock, um, or uh, fisheries being uh, totally canceled because there's just not a market for our U.S. fishermen. And, you know, there's a couple ways to be able to look at this. You know, why is it that U.S. fisheries are, um, you know, an export market? Um, why are we so tied to China? Uh, why are we so tied to these export markets when really we have a relatively uh, healthy, strong, uh, and perhaps even stable domestic consumption. Um, you know, part of it we could look at it at deep, uh, in deep time, and if you've never had a chance to read the very famous book by Mark Kurlansky called Cod, and now maybe you have some time on your hands, uh, it's, a, it's a really fabulous look at how, um, how, how much uh, fisheries uh, are connected to global trade um, through looking at cod. Um, 
and, and fish and fisheries have been connected to global trade for millennia, right? There's this sort of cultural, institutional, and economic deep time that's encoded in uh, all of our fisheries that have kind of uh, made them into, you know, um, uh, entities of global trade. Um, for cod, you know, you have dried and salted cod. Um, that trade uh, between Europe and North America and Asia has been going on for at least a thousand years. Um, salmon uh, traded and uh, salted and later canned for international consumption uh, has been, um, you know, a centerpiece of uh, global uh, markets and trade for um, thousands, hundreds of years, um, if not longer than that. Uh, you know, in Sitka, we have, uh, you know, demonstrated and, and documented trade from, you know, the first decade of the 19th century. Uh, Sitka's salmon uh, showing up in St. Petersburg, Russia, um, well before uh, anywhere that would become the United States. There's the third major uh, global uh, fish, which we often forget about today, but whoever wants to um, email me at nick at sickasalmonshares.com and uh, give me that third uh, fish, uh, I will do something nice for you. It's a secret. That's our only quiz for the day. Um, but in reality, we have to look at, 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 at modern um, global economic policy to really fully understand how, um, how, glo how fisheries as, as global commodities function. And uh, economists uh, or people who are uh, tied to fisheries um, kind of call this global economic policy neoliberalism. And really, the last 30 years of U.S. fisheries policy and trade um, are, are outcomes of uh, global neoliberal economic policy. And there's really three tenets to that policy. And, you know, everything about how U.S. fisheries have, have developed in, these, in the last 30 years, including um, low prices, including our ties to China and the EU, have been a function of this global economic policy. Um, and those, this global economic policy really has three tenets. Um, privatization. Um, we have, um, you know, fisheries from English common law um, have always been considered common property, uh, meaning that they are a public resource for the use of, 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 of the public. Uh, for the last 30 years and maybe going back 40 or 50 years, we've seen a great experiment in privatizing um, those fisheries. Um, with, uh, with uh, permit systems, with quota systems um, that, that creates an ownership-like model um, for fisheries that's entirely new in their, uh, in their global uh, history. So we've privatized these fisheries. Um, we've removed all trade barriers or removed significant amount, number of trade barriers um, to entry, like we have with most um, things that we produce here in the United States. You know, through the 1970s, most domestic sea seafood had either import or export tariffs ranging from about uh, 10 to 40 percent, um, and that uh, more or less kept U.S. domestic seafood protected. Um, and uh, kept a lot of it in the country, especially uh, of the U.S. Uh, domestic processing uh, sector. Uh, most of those tr uh, trade barriers and most of those tariffs are now gone. Um, they're 50 to 80 percent less uh, than they were um, if they are still uh, in existence. If we remember that Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that was at one time uh, ha uh, a big part of um, um, some of Obama's last uh, um, moves. Um, that was a that was a, a, a partnership and a trade deal that was um, primarily uh, aimed at fisheries. So we've pr privatized fisheries. We've removed significantly the trade barriers um, to trading fish back and forth across the globe. And the final thing that the modern reality, the final modern reality of fisheries, is that we've We've really um, embraced this idea of 
um, uh, comparative advantage um, as it relates to um, how we buy and sell fish. And the idea of comparative advantage in, in economics is that every country or entity has a comparative advantage in global trade. And what that kind of means is that uh, every country or, or region or entity can produce something more cheaply and more efficiently because of their unique comparative advantages. And usually that has to do with their capital advantage, capital formation, their labor, um, or their natural resource base. So, you know, at that intersection of their natural resource base, their, their labor and their capital um, sits that entity's comparative advantage. And the idea in globalization or in neoliberalism is that we should just remove all trade barriers, privatize as much of uh, the natural world as we can possibly privatize, and then we should uh, create a world um, in which uh, we can trade commodities back and forth as cheaply across the globe as we can. And that's the idea of comparative advantage, is that every place in the world can produce something more cheaply and more efficiently than somewhere else in the world. Those places should embrace that advantage that they have over the rest of the world. And global economic policy should remove all trade barriers to that trade. And we should go about um, trading. Um, and, uh, commodities as efficiently and as cheaply as possible across the globe. And when we look at where fisheries are today, it's that privatization, it's the removing of those trade barriers, and it's global trade based on these ideas of the comparative advantage um, as is our why we have found ourselves um, in the current uh, situation that we're in. Here's, 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 a, here's a little graph that I put together here to, to show you um, one of the big comparative advantages that China has um, in the processing of uh, salmon. Um, so because of labor and capital formation in China, uh, China has a tremendous comparative advantage in its ability to process salmon more cheaply and more efficiently than anywhere else in the world, although that's changing now as China's labor is becoming more and more expensive. Um, and it's pr uh, precisely the reason uh, why much of the U.S. Uh, fish processing industry has offshored itself in China. And I just wanted to show you an example here of, of, of uh, of this comparative advantage in the uh, processing industry that China has um, as it relates to um, the cost of processing. Two-thirds of Alaska's salmon goes to China. And here's why. Um, if, you look at our, uh, if you look at my little chart here, um, I've got our direct supply chain case study. Um, so you know, here, here's Here's some radical transparency for you, and, and we're not all that different than a lot of uh, other fish processors, except that we do things less efficiently. Um, but if you see, um, it costs uh, Sitka salmon shares about 40 cents uh, to go from Sitka to Seattle. It costs us about another 32 cents to go to Seattle from Seattle to Illinois, meaning that our transportation costs into uh, Illinois are about 72 cents a pound. Uh, to transport fish from Sitka to King Dao, and I, I misspelled that in the notes, um, is about 12 cents each way. So let that uh, soak in. Um, it costs uh, one-third as much uh, to get fish round trip from Seattle to uh, King Dao, where most Alaska's fish are processed, make salmon are processed, then it does uh, cost us to get fish from Sitka to Illinois. But here's where um, here's where the processing uh, uh, here's where the comparative advantage of China uh, really comes into play. For Sitka salmon shares or a company like us to process fish, 
uh, it costs us about three dollars and seven cents a pound. That's 2020's numbers, 2020's projected numbers, and we're probably around there in 2019. Um, again, we're not as efficient as other people. We take our time with our fish, but it costs us about three dollars a pound to process your fish, um, and that's uh, freezing it in the United States. That's cutting it with labor that's paid fairly and offered benefits, um, and that's using you know renewable energy and the land and labor and the land that it takes for us to be able to do what we do is three dollars and seven cents. Um, if we were to take our fish and uh, like most of Alaska does and ship it to China, um, that number goes down to 91 cents. Um, so it's 91 cents a pound uh, for um, a company uh, that might want to freeze fish in uh, Alaska and send it to China for processing. Um, now we process by hand into portions uh, for about $130 a day in labor. Um, in China, uh, that labor is about $8 to $10 a pound, or $8 to $10 a day. It used to be $3 a day, and because of that, uh, more and more fish is going to other places in uh, Asia where it's cheaper. So um, when we look at you know uh, comparative advantages in trade and the removal of trade tariffs and barriers, you see uh, why uh, most of Alaska's uh, salmon uh, goes to China. It is $2.50 less um, than it would cost for us to process it in Sitka. Now we are not efficient, we do things artisanally, but that is probably $1.50 or $2 less than what it would cost to do in the United States in a, in a more efficient operation. So that's 10, 15, 20% of the total cost of the product. Um, and, you know, we see uh, when uh, we are looking at building a global commodity system where everything is done as efficiently and as cheaply as possible, um, why, uh, why fish would be shipped uh, to China in this case. Here's some photos of, of what that process looks like in our little case study of fish being shipped to China. Um, this is from a, a report by an Alaskan economist named Gunnar Knapp. Um, so most of this fish is frozen whole. Uh, it's shipped in totes on, uh, on uh, ocean-going barges like you see here, China Shipping Line, for that 12 cents each way. Um, in China, uh, it is thawed out, as you see here. Most of this happening in King Dao. That fish is filleted. It is pen boned by hand. We don't pen bone our fish. One of the reasons why is labor costs and quality. But in China, you have uh, fish being pen boned by hand. You have that fish being frozen into value added um, portions. You have that fish being put back into uh, those totes where it's now a product of China and being shipped usually into Long Beach or San Diego where it's bought by a secondary processor and turned into a consumer sized um, uh, package. Here's a, this is a package of salmon from uh, that's a German company. But you know, if you look at most wild Alaskan salmon that you find at a grocery store, it is very, very often uh, going to be uh, a product of China. And the reason why it's a product of China goes back to this number right here. Um, China's comparative advantage is in its processing costs and uh, the uh, relative uh, uh, price of uh, fish being able to travel to China for cheaper than it can travel domestically and fish being able to be processed in China for far less than what it is processed in the United States. And 
And the realities of the global trade environment are, are far more profound than just having the offshoring of much of our uh, processing uh, to China. I just gave you that one example uh, because it's an example that we're most familiar with at Sitka Salmon Share is when we try to be competitive on price with the Chinese processed product. Um, but the realities of this global trade environment are, are far more significant. What's happened in the uh, last 30 years is the U.S. market, with the removal of trade barriers and tariffs um, and uh, the ideology and the, of comparative advantage, uh, we see, uh, we've seen a new species of fish uh, flood the U.S. market. Um, the three newest ones um, are shrimp um, and, and Asian species of shrimp, uh, tilapia and catfish called bassa or swai. Most bassa and swai finds its way into the U.S. consumer market mislabeled oftentimes as catfish even though it can't be uh, or as grouper or as snapper uh, or as whitefish. All three of these kind of let's call them species are, are relatively new in the U.S. marketplace in the last 30 years. They have displaced uh, historic uh, American fish. Uh, whether that's American caught shrimp, whether that's American harvested, actually domestically produced catfish, um, or American ground fish from the New England fleet like haddock um, or uh, cod or pollock. The realities of this global trade environment is, is that it's also decimated the domestic fish processing industry. Um, you know, especially, you know, California's once vibrant tuna processing sector. Um, you know, tuna processing in California, which used to employ um, hundreds of thousands of people, um, has now been offshored, in the U.S. at least, usually at, in U.S.-held uh, territories that don't have the same labor protections. Um, while much of, um, oh, here's my, here's my one prop. This is a domestically produced can of albacore, which is about 10 times more, uh, 10 times more costly than a, uh, a globally produced um, a can of albacore, uh, while we've offshored much of the rest of, of U.S. processing. Um, really, when it, you know, as consumers have experienced this flood of shrimp and tilapia and catfish in the last 30 years, or bassa or swai, however you'd like to call it. Um, you know, what we've seen is the gutting of dom American domestic, uh, domestic fish processing and that moving almost entirely offshore. It's also caused prices to be paid to fishermen since 1980 to basically remain stagnant, um, adjusted for inflation. Um, you know, all of our fishermen at Sika Salmon Shares, you know, like I said, we are 15 to 20 percent in most years above what the normal processors are paying. But our fleet, they wonder why, well, why can't we, can't, why can't we get ahead? Uh, why are we still struggling? Um, the reason why is that fishermen basically make today what they made in 1980, uh, while all of their other costs uh, have gone up. And th that, that price stagnation uh, has really been uh, felt most profoundly by the small-scale fleet who sells into this commodity system. Um, it's also kept consumer prices flat when adjusted for inflation. And that's a little bit of a, a misguided, meaning that if you look at consumer prices and you look at uh, fishermen prices, they've kind of been rising in tandem uh, when you look at kind of how inflation um, has, uh, has uh, have reflected, uh, refl are reflected in, that pr in those prices. But what in reality is happening is it's about 60% cheaper today for U.S. consumers um, to eat these newer species um, than it was for um, them to eat uh, comparable species of domestically produced fish in 1980. Um, and, and what that means is that for a consumer that's just looking for a cheap white fish in 1980, um, they would have turned to pollock, uh, they would have turned to haddock, uh, they would have turned to cod, 
Um, now, COD or Haddock or Pollock in, in, in 2020 has been keeping up with inflation, though not growing beyond that. But what has occurred are these cheaper uh, ex imported fish like uh, tilapia and catfish um, or basa or swai um, that are being um, chosen by consumers looking for cheap fish um, instead of those domestically produced fish. Um, and it's also uh, contributed in large part to the current crisis in U.S. fisheries today. Um, as our fisheries and as our fishermen have been uh, wrapped into this new type of global economy based on comparative advantages and efficiencies and lowering trade barriers and uh, the privatization of the resource, uh, they have been more and more exposed to these, uh, to the trends and the, and the currents um, that has um, caused the current crisis in fisheries. And I'll leave today and, and, and answer questions uh, with uh, three uh, questions, you know, for, for us and three questions that I know at Sitka Salmon Shares uh, we struggle with every day in the American seafood industry right now is struggling every day with particularly um, our small-scale fishermen is that in this current environment where, where global economic policy is, is, is what it is, is it even possible uh, to relocalize and redomesticate America's seafood supply chain? Uh, you know, the one that I struggle with is what is the future of America's small-scale fleet when global economic policy almost ensures uh, uh, their disappearance um, and you know what can we do collectively to preserve America's fleet and their livelihood and so I, I think with that that's my 30 minutes um, I, we've got some time for questions uh, and I think maybe the easiest way um, I'm gonna kind of pull back here and uh, and see if I can't pull up uh, the chat and uh, maybe I can go ahead and take a few of uh, the questions here that I've gotten from the chat. Um, one's from Jane Newman. Great question, Jane. So it seems like the biggest discrepancy in cost for processing is the difference in pay and benefits for labor. Um, and, uh, and that is correct. Yeah. Um, the reason why uh, China uh, and uh, other Asian countries or Mexico uh, is uh, cheaper for us to uh, process there is it is largely a function of labor. Um, most uh, developing countries, um, labor is about a third or a tenth the price of domestic labor. And so that's one of the uh, major changes that, um, that uh, we feel when we look at the, the price. Um, uh, I can take another, again, take another question. Maybe let's everybody and it's the right question. How does that work? everybody. Great. I'm going to take the questions from our uh, from our uh, So Paul has asked, does the Sika Salmon CSA help? Um, and uh, or is it too small to make a difference? Um, yeah, it 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 absolutely helps. Uh, for the fishermen who participate in it with us. Um, but, you know, we are a small drop in the bucket um, when you look at where most of our fish go and uh, where most uh, of the fish go um, in Alaska. And, you know, one of the things that I've tried to emphasize is, you know, even if our fishermen are fishing for domestic markets, you know, a lot of Sitka, um, a lot of these coastal communities are tied to the effects of uh, these export 
um, uh, marketplaces. So, uh, yes, uh, however, we're all tied uh, together. Um, from Plymouth Springs Fish Company, what should consumers know about the risk with fish processing in China? Well, most of the fish that comes in, there's two ways to answer that. Most of the fish that comes in from China um, is actually fish that is uh, grown in aquaculture there, um, and that's tilapia. And, um, you know, we should know that uh, the vast majority of that fit, or, or, or catfish, these basa and swai. Um, uh, there, are, um, there are additives and antibiotics that those uh, aquaculture, in, that the aquaculture industry uses there that um, are not allowed in the United States. Um, and they, there is certainly not enough inspecting going on between the FDA and uh, and uh, and the Chinese and Chinese fish that's coming in. Um, so in that sense, uh, we know that uh, China, I think, has the largest number of rejections of any uh, country um, related to uh, FDA inspections. And we know only something like two percent um, of fish uh, is inspected uh, by the FDA when it comes in. So that's a concern. Um, you know, uh, that, that, that would be a bigger concern than the concern related to processing. So, um, you know, the next question is, let's just, uh, are the, um, does um, the Sitka domestic market enable the preservation or, or the fleets necessary uh, to deliver the supply chain, or do they need to supplement their income in another way? Um, all of our, that's a question about like, do our, can our fishermen make it just fishing? Um, it all depends on the season, even for us. Uh, most, if not all of our fleet participate in other fisheries that uh, very likely do go to uh, export markets. Um, and uh, most, if not uh, other, our, uh, uh, most if not all of our other fishermen have other ways to supplement their income. Um, some of them are teachers. Some of them are welders. Some of them are, um, you know, they work in the service industry. So uh, we are able to support uh, pricing that is more fair and consistent uh, for our fleet members. But most of them do have. Um, other uh, jobs. Let's see here. Uh, Carolyn uh, has asked, is this the water version of what happens to the American farmer? Uh, yes, I would put yes and no. I would I would say that there is a strong connection between this and what is taking place in the American uh, the Midwest dairy industry. Um, I think the closest analog is uh, is is American dairy um, uh, or North America or, or excuse me Upper Midwest dairy. Um, upper Midwestern dairy small dairy farmers. Um, are in the exact same position um, as many of these fishermen. They are primarily artisanal, small family producers uh, being forced to compete on a marketplace with uh, large scale uh, product from, in this case, produced domestically in the United States or in Mexico. And it is one of the reasons that they are going out of business in the way that they are. Interestingly, you know, a lot of the small farmers that we buy our product from, you know, meaning most of us in this room, uh, CSA farmers, I like to make the analogy that it would be like our CSA farmer. A lot of our fishermen are in a place uh, that is analogous to our farmers who are farmers uh, of CSAs, in CSAs, having to sell their produce on a global commodity market. Now, that's not to diminish the, the pains that our farmers have um, who grow food for us 
having to compete with grocery stores, um, which is certainly a, a, a huge challenge. But this would be similar to farmers uh, who are growing for us in their CSAs and farmers markets um, needing to export uh, most of their products. So there's a lot of similarities, and uh, particularly ones with the upper Midwestern uh, dairy farmer. Um, are you impacted by domestic U.S. Aqu aquaculture, which is a growing thing here in Wisconsin? I would say that U.S. domestic aquaculture is far more affected by uh, U.S. imports of cheap aquaculture than we are by uh, domestic U.S. aquaculture. And what I would mean by that is artisanal producers, and I would say that most Wisconsin domestic aquaculture is an artisanally produced product. We are all uh, on, in a race to the bottom um, being forced to um, uh, into price competition, whether we like it or not, with cheap imported uh, aqu products or aquaculture or cheap imported uh, 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 internationally produced or processed uh, fish. So, you know, I see that as a much more uh, significant, I don't want to say threat, uh, but challenge um, than domestically, domestic aquaculture. Now, am I a wild fish advocate? Absolutely. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, we have a lot more in common with the small guy uh, doing aquaculture in Wisconsin uh, than we do with, uh, you know, big commodity fish, wild or, uh, uh, or um, aquaculture uh, globally. Another question, are there any meaningful difference between the China fish processors and sweatshops? Um, no. You know, many of the things that you read about uh, sweatshops um, are similar to, you know, when we read about Apple, we read about, you know, getting, you know, our clothes produced there. It's similar. It's pretty similar. Um, so how do we combat uh, what's going on, promote U.S. processing? Um, one of the things that is happening is uh, we are seeing a lot more processing come back online here in the United States. A lot of it's been mothballed, um, you know, but uh, we are seeing uh, a much greater processing demand taking place. Um, you know, we have a little processing capacity in the U.S., not what, not what China has done, uh, but we do have some. Um, additionally, um, you know, what, what is coming back online is, you know, is seeing great gains. Uh, I will say that because of the trade war um, that's been taking place for the last two or three years, um, we've got, um, we've seen more and more processing uh, come back um, into the United States. And, uh, you know, that produces more expensive fish, um, but that overall is probably better. Uh, than uh, what's taking place um, in China. So uh, how are Sika Salmon Shares fishermen in particular faring during this time? Um, we have a pricing system at Sika Salmon Shares that, uh, you know, we, we have what, what we like to call a minimum price. That would be kind of called our fair trade, it would be considered our fair trade price. Um, and unless things uh, are happening that are catastrophic, um, we've got uh, our fair trade price in place or our minimum price in place uh, to help support um, and preserve the gains that our small-scale fishermen uh, have made uh, with us in the last decade. Uh, right now, uh, those fair trade prices are, say, for halibut, 45% above what our dock is. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, 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 this, uh, our, our domestic market for home consumers uh, right now is really um, having a uh, outsized uh, amount of support for our fleet 
um, much more outsized than in quote unquote good years, right? There are there are years in which the domestic or in which the global commodity market um, can deliver uh, stronger prices uh, than others, and um, uh, this year will not be one of those years. And it happens about every five years where you see a tremendous crash um, in prices related to some global uh, economic um, change, um, this one being a, a pretty tremendous one, but we saw one in 2015 with salmon. And, um, you know, it's in these years where our system um, and I know, you know, probably half of you on this call are CSA members or CSF members, sick of salmon shares members. It's uh, these years where our, our system really does offer um, tremendous support for our fleet um, and can really help make or break or make um, a season that could break them. Um, good question, how do small processors better communicate the message of trade, fair trade locally? Uh, consumers have their ears to the concept of fair trade outside the US, U.S., but perhaps don't understand the issues uh, um, that are here in the United States. I don't know, Tracy, if you want to help us communicate fair trade uh, um, <laughs> to our consumers, that would be great. Um, but it is, you know, you, you just... You know, we, you know, our average uh, wage in uh, in Sitka, when you look at our benefits and our housing, is over fifteen dollars an hour. We're using, um, you know, renewable. It's not considered renewable because of because uh, it uses dams, but we're using renewable energy. Um, you know, we're treating our workers fairly, um, and uh, that's a a uh, far cry uh, from uh, what the costs uh, uh, are. To do that is a far cry from what the costs are um, of, uh, of, of, of uh, using uh, this offshore processing. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the uh, model that Sika Salmon shares has, uh, has, um, has, has been part of and um, it is also uh, what many, many other uh, smaller uh, fishermen are going to. Um, good question. Here's an, any possibility of using the organic valley model of uh, small producer industry-wide support and marketing model. Um, you know, uh, a rising tide lifts all ships. When Sitka Salmon Shares began, there was maybe a couple dozen um, people doing this, meaning a couple dozen uh, fishermen or companies uh, that were uh, supporting um, these types of um, entities. And now there's a couple hundred. And what I think has happened is that there is an aware awareness raised um, by, uh, uh, by companies like ours um, and, and, and you know, uh, companies like, you know, thinking just here in Madison, um, uh, Bearing Bounty or Quijack Fish Company um, or in, in uh, Indiana, I think it's wild Alaskan uh, salmon and seafood. There's quite a few in Minnesota. The more the merrier because uh, I think it really helps raise awareness that, you know, <laughs> there is a high cost to cheap fish, an e extremely high cost to cheap fish. And these small-scale American fishermen uh, and uh, are... Are, are the ones that are suffering. And, 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 and to be honest, uh, we, we, are, we, we are not even close, I think, at Sick of Salmon Shares um, to being able to capture what I think is the true value of a fish that is caught individually, harvested individually, by a fisherman who is making uh, a fair wage and who's being able to support their families in an incredibly dangerous op occupation and uh, process, processing that in a fair way uh, in the United States and uh, getting that directly to home consumers. And, you know, we feel the downward pressure. Um, you know, all, all I need to do is look at our Internet marketing and, you know, once or twice a day seeing, well, $25 a pound for fish, that's pretty pricey. And, you know, unfortunately, that's the, that's the downward pressure 
that uh, cheap uh, imported fish and offshore uh, fish processing causes. Um, and uh, you know, and that's 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 the unfortunate uh, thing. And um, so I can do. Uh, I'll do one more question here. And um, you know, maybe one question would be. Let's see here. Uh, based on this environment, is Sika salmon share is going to survive? I hope so. <laughs> uh, no, we are surviving. Um, you know, we have continued. We've continued to be buoyed uh, by members, uh, by CSF members. Uh, we continue to feel strong uh, tailwinds uh, from people knowing that the current system um, is letting their bodies down, is letting the environment down, is letting people who work in the food chain down, uh, be it workers or be it producers. And as awareness has been raised by you know, the local food movement, um, primarily in agriculture, um, that awareness is now starting to be felt um, uh, in fisheries. And so uh, Sitka Salmon Shares has continued to grow. Um, we continue to uh, support the lives of a growing number of fishermen. You know, when we started, we had three boats. Uh, now we had thir and now we have 30. But, you know, again, back to the reality of the situation, there are tens of thousands of small-scale fishermen right now in the United States that are suffering uh, from this uh, commodity system of imports and exports. And that's not to minimize the suffering of others in this, in this time, but it is to acknowledge, I think, the global economic system uh, that we're a part of right now and that uh, the coronavirus um, and the tremendous and sweeping uh, destruction that it's causing um, is is now exposed, and I, you know, and I think uh, from all of us, you know, I, I think we're all, you know, if there is a, a, a silver lining, uh, I think from all of us uh, that there is um, an opportunity here um, to reorient ourselves uh, and to uh, rethink our priorities. Um, as a country and as an economy and as, as, as eaters. So I think with that, I'm at time. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Sean and Sharon for setting us up. And I want to thank uh, our fishermen and all those fishermen out there um, who, are, who are doing what they're doing for us. We'll take care, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>